Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. On this episode of Garden DC, we're talking to April Thompson, Director of Bloom Sales and Marketing, and we're going to explore the world of foraging. Welcome, April. Thank you, Kathy. So you have a full-time job, but one of your passions is foraging, so I wanted to talk to you about that today, but maybe first we'll talk about you and how you got into gardening, how you uh, became the director of sales for Bloom, and maybe a little bit about Bloom. Sure. Where should I start? <laughs> well, um, uh, tell us what Bloom is for our listeners. I would be glad to. Bloom is what's called a biosolid product, which is essentially a fertilizer that is um, created from the wastewater stream. So um, DC Water has actually the largest, most advanced wastewater treatment plant in the world at Blue Plains. And uh, through this process, um, which is essentially thermohydrolysis, it's like a giant pressure cooker um, that takes the incoming waste and, um, you know, um, basically removes any pathogens, it gets dewatered. And the result is this beautiful, slow released fertilizer that can be used to grow absolutely anything. So some listeners might be familiar with melorganite. Um, would you compare the product with that? Sure. Uh, melorganite uh, comes from M Milwaukee, hence the name. And it's been around for around 100 years. So they are um, in markets all over the country with a bagged product that, um, you know, is good for lawns and gardens. Um, one of the main differences is that theirs is a, a heat dry product. So it's um, it's highly concentrated because they've removed, you know, most of the water. Whereas with our products and we have several in our line of products, we have a, a, a blend that you can buy from um, from resellers and, and from Blue Plains. Um, and we also have a bagged product that's the closest to malorganite. But um, even though, you know, if you crack open a, a bag, it seems dry, there's still moisture in that that is um, kind of essentially means that the, the nitrogen and the, the macronutrient content, um, you know, by percentage is not quite as high um, as, as malorganite. Um, but otherwise, you can use it in the same way. You're just going to maybe need more than you would if you're, if you're using more concentrated product. Mm -hmm. And what are some of your recommendations for using it as a top dressing with, for tropical plants or how would you use it in your own garden? Sure. And I do use it in my home garden. I actually am a member of a community garden here in Parkview in, in DC, and I will incorporate that into my garden beds. Um, I also use it on my house plants. I'll, I'll just kind of sprinkle a little bit on top. Um, but Generally speaking, if you can incorporate it, you're going to have the best result. You want to get, you know, any any fertilizer product you're you're working with, you want to get the nutrients in the root zone where the the plant can take that up. Um, certainly, uh, we have a lot of customers that top dress with it as well, and and that works great too. Um, but you're just going to kind of get get the best results if if you are able to incorporate it, which which can be challenging in the compacted soils that we're often dealing with in the area. But um, that hard work is going to pay off um, over the the long run, and our product works over the long run too. Since it's a slow release product, you'll see um, that the benefits will be reaped over you know more than one season, as opposed to a, a a chemical fertilizer that's kind of like a quick fix for your lawn. Mm -hmm. And I know that people who use melorganite uh, swear that it's a deer deterrent <laughs> as well. Have you have you found that to be the case with Bloom as well? I have heard that as well. Um, I'm 
I haven't heard that so much um, regarding the deer. That's a good question. It it, it does uh, it does come up, but I'm not quite sure. Hmm, that would have to be something that we test out. Um, and how can people get bloom? Is it something that they can get in bulk, or you had referred to it being bagged as well? Yeah, it's available in bulk and bag in D.C., Maryland, Virginia, um, both through retailers that are listed on their website, bloomsoil.com, as well as directly from um, from our team, um, depending on the, the size and the type of the order. So, for example, for, for bags, we... Um, we sell them by the pallet, so that's more for you know commercial landscapers or, or resellers. Um, if you're just looking to pick up a bag, you, you're best off going to our website and looking at the, the list of retailers. Um, if you've got a big long reno job, um, you know it you, you might be best served going through through us. Um, our minimum bulk order size is 15 yards, though, so 15 cubic yards. Otherwise, there are other resellers. Um, and also blenders who will take our fresh material and then do their own custom blends with that as well. And those are all listed on their website. People can also, you know, reach out to me if they're interested in using it and I can make a recommendation. Great. And I know I have a bag that I've been trialing both in containers and my vegetable garden plot. So um, I luckily don't have deer pressure on either of those places, but I will try it out in a place that does have deer um, so I can report back on that aspect. Oh, great. Yeah. And send us photos. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully photos of no deer damage. <laughs> <laughs> so um, turning back to you and how you uh, got to be uh, with Bloom, what is your background and are you a garden geek yourself? As from childhood or did you come to it later in life? Yeah, I, I definitely am a bit of a garden and nature geek um, stemming back from childhood. My uh, maternal grandparents ran a flower shop where I had my first um, barely paid job <laughs> um, and also had a grandmother on my father's side who was an orchid grower and also um, very much a, a, an avid gardener. And so I, I definitely think I kind of caught the bug from from them and, and just had a, you know, an interest from a from young age in exploring the world around me. And I can remember, you know, living in a um, kind of a rough neighborhood of Portland um, briefly when we were a kid and um, and just roaming the neighborhood. And I, I can remember coming across these wild plum trees and, you know, just, you know, eating from the plum tree as, as a child. So I, I guess my foraging. Um, my interest in foraging really stems back that far, although it's been in recent years that it's really completely um, captured my my time and imagination. Do you remember ever going out mushroom picking or other type of um, maybe pick your own places with your family? Not so much that I can remember, certainly not mushrooms. That has been something that I've come to on my own, although um, it's been fun to turn on other people around me um, to, to mushrooms. I had a extended um, getaway with, with some old friends and they have two young boys. Um, and this was, this was in Saluda, Virginia, this, this summer. Um, we got, they all got their COVID tests and then we all, you know, just piled in for the week. And um, the, the knowledge that the six-year-old pick, picked up um, just from a week kind of hanging around and looking at things with me was, was unbelievable. And I, um, I sent him a, a kid's mushroom book when we got back and his mom says he reads this every night and they just had their um, parent teacher conference and, the, and the, the teacher said, all he talks about is mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's, you know, people think about it as, as being a solitary activity and it can, but it, it can also bring people together as well. Mm -hmm. And children of that age are such sponges and, you know, will soak up all that knowledge that people can share with them. So it's it's great to mentor uh, children in gardening and, you know, in general uh, for love of plants. Absolutely. Yeah, I have a childhood memory of um, 
we were stationed in Alaska for a couple of years when I was in preschool and kindergarten age. And I do remember mushroom foraging um, and going blueberry picking. And I was, of course, terrified the whole time that bears would come because I'd heard about <laughs> bears. <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, I had a great time. And that does bring up... Um, competing with wildlife for foraging. So Mm -hmm. maybe we'll jump into some of the um, do's and don'ts of foraging. And I know some of them are more um, personal ethical guidelines for a lot of foragers. Um, But I do know that there are several books outlining, you know, how much you should take, what you should take, and what basic principles do you follow? That, that's a, an interesting question, and it's not a straightforward one, um, because, you know, what's ethical is not necessarily legal, and what's legal is not necessarily ethical. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of plants that we forage that um, are actually doing the ecosystem a favor to forage, because they are highly invasive plants that are crowding out um native plants and and putting everything in imbalance. A great example of that is garlic mustard, which I'm sure you're familiar with um, and kind of runs ragged throughout this area. Um, Rock Creek Park, you'll you'll find it all over the place. Um, This is actually, um, according to John Callis, who is a, um, a forager who's got some great books out there, the most nutritious wild green or green period, wild or domestic um, that has ever sort of been nutritionally analyzed. And yet it's, it's terrible for our em- environments. And I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, where, um, you know, where it is native to, but it's not native to here. Um, so forage away uh, when it comes to something like that. Then you take something like like ramps that are a more endangered species, and that's something where you want to be very careful. You want to be mindful about um, over foraging. Um, There's also ways that you can um, forage for something like that that does not damage the the bulb um, and and allows it to regrow. So, um, you know, so it's it really depends on the plant. It depends on the place. it depends on a lot of things. Yeah, and as a weed warrior, uh, we were taught that you can pick enough that you could eat in that one session, but you couldn't strip everything. So they were saying, say if you came across uh, like the wild blueberry blueberry mm-hmm. bush I referred to, that you could have a handful and then move along um, is basically what they were saying for local park rules. Um, do you know if it's the same rules for national parks, which um, the federal properties do take up a great deal of Washington, D.C.? Yeah, um, technically, uh, for Rock Creek Park, for example, nothing um, that you shouldn't be taking anything out of the park, period. Um, so mm-hmm. and this is where legal versus ethical. I have I have my questions. I <laughs> will leave it there. But again, you'll find tons of garlic mustard in Rock Creek Park. But if you if you follow the the guidelines, you know, to the letter rather than the spirit of the law, you shouldn't be taking any of that away. Period. And then there's um, the philosophy that Native Americans have, and I recall Robin Wall Kimmerer giving a talk on that: of you should never take the first of one item that you encounter, nor the last. Hmm. Um, so I thought that was a very interesting philosophy um, that and that ensured that there was always something for the next person. I like that. <laughs> and that would be, of course, on properties where you'd had permission to forage. Right. Right. Although if you're talking your own property, then I see mm-hmm. for it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And she was saying, you know, obviously, if it was your own that you thank uh, Mother Nature or however you um, envision the bounty of nature being given to you um, as you're taking those items and then have a purpose for them. And again, they were saying, don't take everything. (laughs) Obviously it won't return back to the land if you take every single one of those ramp bulbs with you. Right. Um, And similarly, I was hearing from a mushroom forager and I don't know if you do this, but they were saying that you should always use a basket to collect 
mushrooms that has um, not solid bottom to it. Mm -hmm. And and in that case, you're dropping the spores of the mushrooms as you're walking out through the forest and you're kind of acting like a little mushroom planting fairy. Um, and, And you were saying before that some things actually benefit from being foraged and that might be considered one of them. Absolutely. The caveat I would give there is that um, often, um, you know, when, when when you're collecting specimens, you you'll also be collecting sometimes some things that you're not sure about, and you need to go home and do a spore print and do more research. Um, and um, some of those may may not be things you want to be spreading because they um, they are poisonous or you know, um, parasitic. And, and this is where it's, you know, the answer is, again, it's complicated because um, some things that are, you know, wonderful and edible for us um, are, are parasitic to, you know, particular trees or even, even other mushrooms. There are parasitic mushrooms that, um, that parasitize the original mushroom and then they leave behind something delicious, um, like something called shrimp of the woods. So um, nature is complicated, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And that's why we're going to dive in a little bit more into the subject. And maybe let's talk about um, why one person would forage. So, you know, we have a grocery store down the street. Um, most of us can readily purchase food at any time. Um, and we are growing our own food, as you said, in your garden plot. So why would you wild forage in addition to that? Oh, why, why not is the question for me, but uh, I would say, um, free food, uh, free exercise, uh, medicine. Um, I, I, I collect some, um, some wild edibles that, that also have medicinal properties. Um, really just experimenting with new flavors that you can't buy. Um, there's, there are really some interesting, intriguing things that, that you can forage. And again, um, an opportunity to interact with the environment in a really, um, just a really meaningful and memorable way um, and potentially supporting the ecosystem in some of the ways we've touched on. Um, And I would say that the community and camaraderie, I'm um, a member of some some groups that um, has just been a a real um, portal into another community that I didn't know existed before this. And that's a great point is the community. So if you're a beginning forager, uh, where would you start? Would you check a book out of the library? Would you sign up for a foraging walk? Yeah, there are lots of things you can do. And I would, um, I would recommend um, diving in and in any way that kind of strikes you. But, um, you know, one thing is just start by learning more about some of the common plants that you may already recognize, like dandelions, which are um, food medicine and um, have the distinction of all parts of the plant being edible. Um, Facebook groups are also great. If you're on Facebook, um, there's there's tons of them out there that can help you identify things, that can give you um, tips for cooking and so forth. Uh, follow, following foragers on social media. And um, if you can, going out on a foray with someone who knows their stuff is, is really great. There, um, there's someone named Matt Cohen in the area that when I was first getting started, I, I did a couple of his uh, paid walks. And one of the nice things about that um, was he would also have some prepared things with a wild food that he would bring along too. So you could kind of taste that on the trail. Um, Guidebooks are great. Um, apps can be helpful. And um, Google is also your friend. <laughs> so, um, you know, if, if I come across something or I'm trying to identify something, I will just Google that, that plant or mushroom and I will try to learn as much as I can about how to identify it. Um, I will also Google um, lookalikes so you can see what other plants may resemble it so you can help be more confident in your identification. That's a great point about identification and and knowing your plants, obviously, before you um, try to eat them and going with an experienced forager can help a lot with that. And were there any mistakes that you made in the beginning on identification that you were, you know, you learned your lesson on? Or (laughs) are there some common plants that that people usually do mistake when they start out? Oh, um, 
I I feel like there there's sort of a, a curve where you start out kind of fearful and then maybe reach a point where you start to feel too comfortable or a little bit cocky, <laughs> or, or at least that may happen to some. And, and then you have a sobering experience that wisens you up. Um, one, one of, one of the, the best known forging jokes or sayings is that there are, there are old foragers, there's bold foragers, but there are no old bold foragers because truly one mistake, particularly with mushrooms can be deadly. Um, and I, I don't want to scare people because it's, you know, there there are ways to be sure of, of what you're doing, but you do need to be 100% sure of the identification of something that you're eating 100% of the time. Um, and I did have a bad experience once um, out visiting my, my friends in Denver and um, ate a very small handful, I want to say three berries maybe, that I was not 100% sure of. And I was very ill for two days. Um, so that was my, that was my sobering moment. Um, I, um, I have not had any bad experiences with, with mushrooms, but I did discover um, there. So there are some mushrooms that can have a, a bad interaction with alcohol um, and some that um, that can be the case with a minority of people. There are also a, um, some very choice edible mushrooms that just don't agree with a minority of people. That that can be true of some wild plants too. So the rule of thumb is first time you're trying something, even if you know 100% this is, this is good to go, you want to try a little bit of it before you have more just to make sure that your system is okay with that. So um, the, um, the mushroom in question was honey mushrooms, which are um, you know, prolific in fall. And I had, um, I had successfully eaten them on a, on a few different occasions. And I had these with a, a good part of a bottle of wine. And um, my system really did not <laughs> appreciate that. And I had that with a, um, you know, with a friend who did not have that experience, we had eaten and drank the same amount of the same thing. That's a great point that personal reactions or allergies, um, can very be very individual, and you don't know until, of course, that first time you've tasted or experienced something. Um, so, uh, trying just one new thing with each meal yeah. might help with that, and not doing like a wild green forage salad with, say, ten different greens, and then you right. have a reaction to it and don't know what that might be that's in there. Exactly. Yeah, you want to try one thing at a time. Otherwise, you're you're really not able to know what what did you wrong and do you have any favorite spots for foraging in the city i don't want you to give away all your secrets <laughs> but um speaking maybe in general um that urban dwellers or inner suburban dwellers might be able to access you know it's funny i um people talk about these secret spots i don't have any secret spots i don't necessarily even have any favorite spots. Um, this this year during COVID, I have, every time I've gone out to forage, I have um, picked a different park, a different part of the park um, to explore. And I've, I think I've, and, and this year I've, I found well over a hundred edible plants and fungi. And I think, you know, part of the, you know, diversity of the things I've found is just kind of going to different nooks and crannies. Um, I guess also I would say, depending on the time of year, you're gonna be looking for different types of things. In spring, there are so many um, delectable wild weeds um, that you know I could, I could eat just from uh, my own city block here. Whereas in summer, you're looking more at wild berries, um, particular summer mushrooms, and into fall, um, I'd say that's kind of more of a, a mushroom season for me. Um, and that's kind of the fun of it too, is that, you know, different things are popping at different times of year and also different, um, you know, different parts of the plant may be edible at different um, times of year as well. Yeah, that's um, really relevant is the season. And of course, your your local um, 
location where you refer to um, not being familiar with the berries in Denver, um, if you're coming from another part of the country to the Mid-Atlantic or the East Coast, um, it might be different things that you're foraging for than you are uh, used to or back uh, where you might have foraged before. Um, or is there something that you really prize? And it might not be something that's rare or anything that like that, but that you're like, yes, I got that this year. Oh, well, definitely there are, are some mushrooms that are really prized finds. Um, I found only one, um, but a uh, wild porcini on my, my folks' property in Saluda this year. That was really lovely. Um, I found lots of things this fall. Um, I found a bunch of bluets. That was my first time and really, um, really liked the flavor of that. Um, bluets have this beautiful lavender color, um, although it fades as, as it ages and gets larger. Um, mushrooms can be really tricky that way in terms of, um, which is why things like spore prints can be really important because um, two different specimens of the same mushroom can look very different sometimes. So, um, but that was a good find. Um, trying to think what, what else. Um, I, I know a lot of folks had a really good morel season this year. I, I found a few, but not many. Um, those are really delectable mushrooms that come out just for a couple of weeks in spring, right around my birthday. <laughs> Um, and those are, are hollow, so you can actually stuff them and do some fun things with them in terms of, you know, culinary experiments. Hmm. And how often do you go foraging? Is this something that you do on every walk that you're taking? Or do you have specific um, weekend hikes that you go on? Every time I am out interacting with nature anywhere, I, I have my eyes peeled. <laughs> so, um, and I, I'd say there's there's probably very rarely a day where I'm, I'm out um, and don't find something of, of some sort. Um, I came across a bunch of wild rose hips the other day. Um, so, um, and that's, that's the thing where really your, your knowledge builds on itself, where, you know, the more that you know, the more that you, you see that was there all along, but you just did not have the knowledge to, um, to be able to identify that plant. Um, but yeah, this this season especially this year, I should say, um, I've I've been going out, you know, a couple times a week, probably at least. Are you preserving a lot of that? Because I know you can get a lot at once of one thing, and then most of the items you want to eat while they're fresh or where the, while they're in the stage that they're the best edible. Yeah, I'm I'm not doing so much in terms of preservation. I'm not a canner or anything like that. I don't have a dehydrator, although I do use the pilot light in my oven to sort of, you know, quick dry some things. Um, but um, I, I found a ton of woodier recently, actually, and um, I foraged, you know, I, I harvested a lot of it and I, I gave it away. Um, I just went on next door and said, hey guys, I, I have a bunch of woodier. And I was amazed at how many people came forward because I thought, oh, people are going to be, this is kind of a weird taste and people are going to be scared to like take a forage mushroom from a stranger, but um, that wasn't the case. Um, I, I will do like some pestos from, from foraged items and freeze that because that freezes well. Um, let's see. Also, um, turkey tail, which is a medicinal mushroom um, that is it's very thin, so it's, you know, it, it's practically dried already, um, the, the way that, um, that you'll find it naturally. That is great for medicinal tea, um, and I will just lightly process that, basically, as I said, drying it in my oven just with a pilot light, and then putting it in my spice grinder, it kind of um, grinds to, um, you know, almost like shredded newspaper is what it looks like. Um, and then I will just keep that in the freezer until I'm ready to do um, a tea with that. Are there any um, things that you forage for that afterwards you said, eh, not worth it? That takes too much processing or maybe the flavor afterwards wasn't something that you loved? Yeah, um, this year for the first time, I processed acorns. <laughs> 
And that was time consuming. <laughs> Um, and of course it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's at a time in the dead of winter where there's nothing else to be had <laughs> and nothing else to do perhaps. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, I probably, probably wouldn't do it again or not for a while. Um, but I, I did do some interesting things with it, including like a, a, a wild acorn cheese, um, there's a there's a forager um, Pascal Bodar who has some really interesting uh, books and resources out there on um, wildcrafted fermentation. So I had used um, one of his recipes. Um, I tried to do like this acorn falafel, but it was just mm, yeah, not you know, and and also you know perhaps I didn't do the best job you know um, stripping all the tannins, but. Um, that's one thing. Um, I did dandelion wine one year and um, that was a heck of a lot of work just to, <laughs> um, to harvest enough dandelions. And then you have to remove the callus, the calyx, the, um, the green bitter part that um, connects to the petals. And my hands were just cracked and, and you know, black by, by the end of that. And I would say the flavor wasn't even all that. Um, but one of those things where I can say I've been there, done that. And, and honestly, I would encourage people to try everything once because everyone's palate is different and it's fun. It's fun to, you know, to, to just do some of these experiments, the, the process itself. Um, there, there are also some common weeds that I just find kind of grassy and the, the flavor uninteresting um, considering that there are lots of other really tasty things like uh, like plantain um, and mallow, I'm not really a, a fan of that. Um, but plantain, for example, has medicinal value. So, um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of these plants do have um, multiple purposes. Yeah, and I've heard that story about acorn processing from several people. That, <laughs> uh, it's a lot more calories expended uh, than you get out of it. And then the end result is kind of, Mm, still bitter, still not that great. But yeah, I think it would have to be, you know, a zombie apocalypse starving situation. And you'd be glad that you knew how to do it, but maybe not worth it. Right. So for dandelions, um, are there any recipes that you have? So you, you, the wine is a little labor intensive and maybe not worth it. But for the fresh greens in springtime, do you just eat them raw, straight in a salad, or do you do any other preparations for them? Oh, I wouldn't eat them raw just because they they are rather bitter. Um, and unless I guess you're you're mixing them in with with some milder greens, um, I actually just just pick some and steam some today that I'm going to have with some eggs. Um, in the morning, that's one of my favorite, you know, simple things just to do is wild greens and eggs. Um, so let's see what else with dandelion. Um, the flowers are also edible as well as the root. So the, the flowers, um, you can use in baking. Um, I, I've done, um, dandelion head fritters, just, you know, fry them up. Um, I've also had them in cookies and things like that. Um, you can also do a tea with it. Um, yeah, but the, um, I'd say with the greens, um, you know, just, I, I would cook them as you would any other green. Um, and again, just be aware that it does have a rather bitter flavor profile. So if that's not your thing, you know, you might want to pair it with, you know, some kind of sauce that balances that out or, or um, cook it with some other greens. And how about chickweed, uh, Stellaria media? I'm going to make sure I'm saying the, the right Latin name for that so people can ID it because sometimes they get chickweed and henbit and a few of those other low growing things like um, uh, ground hugging weeds mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point. Um, I, I, I confess I'm, I'm terrible with the Latin for a lot of things. I've, I've picked it up a little by little, but it can be important because there are, there can be um, different plants that have the same common name and there can be one plant with multiple common names also. So it can, it can get confusing and the Latin is the great leveler. So 
Um, chickweed. Yeah, I um, I have a bunch of chickweed coming up in my garden plot right now, and I'm just letting it go because I think it's just a great um, salad stuffer, like just to kind of add a little, you know, heft. Um, it um, I don't find it has a whole lot of flavor. It's got a nice little light crunch to it. Um, you could put it on a um, on a sandwich like you would some sprouts or, or lettuce. Um, I had mentioned Pascal Bodar earlier. I did a really interesting fermented spicy chickweed paste um, that I can't even begin to tell you all that went into that, but that was actually really delicious. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, some of these things are a lot more versatile than, than you'd realize. And, um, I, again, Google is your friend. I'll, I'll come across something new and, you know, I'll go to my, my go-to resource books and see how they suggest using it. And then a lot of times I'll, I'll go to the internet and see what else is out there. And it does seem like pesto is always the number one recipe. <laughs> no. It's an easy fallback. And, and there's so much you can do with pesto um, in terms of the flavor. Um, I re recently did a lemon balm pesto that was really good. Um, I, I feel like to call it pesto, all you really need is, you know, the oil, the garlic, and some kind of green. And then, you know, beyond that, you can put anything you want. I've I've added yogurts. Um, I, oh, let's see, what what else have I done in terms of wild pestos? Um, I, I, I'm blanking, but I've done a lot of pesto experiments. And again, it freezes well. Um, and it also is a good way to use a lot of something because it, you know, once you um, blend that up, it will compact pretty well. So that's also a great way to kind of really maximize the nutritional value that you're getting from something because obviously you're going to, you're going to be using a lot more of that than you are if you're having it in a salad, let's say. Hmm. And that brings to mind one of the most expensive elements of, of classic pesto is the pine nuts. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever forage besides the acorns for um, nuts in the area? That's a good question. I, um, I have not. Um, in in my uh, community garden, we do have a forest garden, and we've got some some nut trees there. Although some of those I've cracked open and been very disappointed <laughs> what I found or didn't find. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't really done so much um, with with wild nuts. Um, black walnut is something that you'll you'll find all over the place, and most people don't don't bother with. Um, I did use that in some bitters that I made. Um, it turned it very, very dark. <laughs> um, I've also seen some neat recipes for, um, for pickling black walnut um, when, when you're kind of getting it earlier in the season. And that's supposed to be really nice for kind of like a charcuterie, um, you know, offering. Mm -hmm. And what about um, herbal uses just for adding like a flavor kick? And I'm particularly thinking of like the little sorrel Mm -hmm. weed that pops up everywhere um it's not something i would eat in quantity uh because it has the oxalates in it mm -hmm. but maybe something that you would add just a touch of are there any favorite flavorings that you have oh um wood sorrel that you're referring to oxalis i i actually love that that's one of my favorite little um trail snacks because it has that lemony flavor and um i think that's in john callis's book that has a really simple oxalis soup recipe that I really love. And it was one of those things I was like, Ugh, I don't know how this is going to be. Um, and definitely had a few of those experiments where I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't make that again. Maybe it wasn't that I wouldn't try that experiment, that, that um, ingredient again, but I wouldn't prepare it in that particular way. Um, but that, um, that's really, that's really nice. Also, um, uh, Virginia pepper weeds, poor man's pepper. Uh, it's like, Lodosisum virginium. I, I can, I can sort of like, kind of see what the what the um, botanical name is, but I can't remember it exactly. Anyhow, um, that has a really interesting um, peppery, like horseradishy flavor, and there you're you're harvesting the little tiny seed pods in spring, and then you can kind of use that as a condiment, and that's something I guarantee is 
probably on most people's block here in the city. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture of it now. I just Googled it. It's Lepipedium virginicum. Okay. And yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah Lepidium, Lepidium uh, virginicum. And I can recognize it as the weed that pops up between the sidewalk cracks. And it does mm-hmm. have that little um, tiny seed pouches on the top that burst open. So I can definitely see um, that it might be a, a nice nutty flavor from them. And it says it's a member of the mustard family, which yeah, a, yeah. a lot of our um, edible weeds are. Yeah. Another thing that is an interesting flavor that I think gets overlooked is using pine or, or other evergreen needles. Um, one of the things I made this year from a recipe from a, a forager I, who's got some great books, um, a cookbook I love. Um, her name is Mary Viljuin, and she's based in New York City. Um, anyhow, it was a... Um, a lemon fir needle or pine needle ice cream. And it was so delicious. And I have done lots of different experiments with, uh, with evergreen needles um, this earlier this year at the, at the beginning of the year. Yeah. I'd been seeing lately that um, some chefs were experimenting with pine needles and recipes and mosses of all things. Have you, have you done any mosses? Ooh, I have not played around with mosses. <laughs> That might be the next frontier for me. Yeah, I think the other thing I was seeing was barks. With the, they were making um, desserts or tinctures or like a, a foam just with a, a hint of either a moss or a bark flavoring to them. Well, you think about it. I mean, cinnamon, we, we all use cinnamon and that's, that's the bark of the cinnamon tree. So um, I guess the thing with bark is that that is like the skin of the tree. So I guess you'd have to I, I know there are, um, there's techniques out there to, to forage for bark that um, does not damage the, the tree, but that would be something to be aware of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unless it was already something that had been taken down or fell right. down. True. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that would be a, a tough one to make sure on the sourcing for that. Um, and then I was, wanted to ask you a little bit more about mushroom foraging. So I know that there's a mycology club in the area in the dc area that goes on regular hikes together and of course probably in this time of covid they're use a little more careful and use some social distancing but um those are great for being along with the expert to be able to id mushrooms are you a member of that group i am um that is the mycological association of washington and it is a mere twenty dollars a year to join and you have access to to really world-class experts in in this um it's um right now we are doing virtual forays and virtual uh, monthly meetings so with the virtual forays uh people submit photos of things that they're finding and then um there's a a virtual foray leader that goes through them all and and helps identify them and then we have monthly meetings where we've got um, guest speakers from different parts of the world or country um, that speak on all sorts of different topics related to to mushrooms. So I highly recommend that. I've learned a ton um, just going out with those folks. Um, although right now there there are no in person forays. And we all, we have an organization in common, April and I, and that's um, Knowledge Common DC. And maybe you want to tell our listeners a little bit about that organization. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I am a volunteer organizer for. For Knowledge Commons DC or KCDC, and um, occasional instructor as well, um, and have have worked with you, Kathy, on a couple of, of classes. Um, but essentially, we are a free roaming school, um, you know, led by volunteers, taught by volunteers around DC. In normal times, we're we're holding classes at different community spaces all over the city. Um, that can be parks, libraries. Um, all sorts of different spaces, interesting spaces sometimes. Um, and they're typically short, um, maybe, you know, one to two hour courses on some quirky topic that some um, some kind of knowledgeable person um, volunteers to, to teach. And um, right now during times of COVID, we have pivoted online and have been doing um, a series of online classes, um, including one I did on foraging. So 
that's uh it's a great mm. and and um i believe actually let me look at the website real quick so i can make sure that i'm giving everyone the right yeah i want to say it's knowledgecommonsdc.org but definitely check on that and then i was going to say that i sat in on that foraging talk and i know that you had a great turnout for that um through kcdc and they've also partnered to do some of the educational programming that takes place every year with the dc state fair um, and that's i believe dcstatefair.org as well and that took place um uh, about what was it four to six six weeks back and hopefully we'll be coming back in person next year uh, if we can do that again and um did you come up with the website yet yep it is knowledgecommonsdc.org uh, mm-hmm. and yeah i know you had done your uh flower ranging class which you had taught for kcdc before and was was wonderful i've taken some great classes from you Kathleen. um my my kokodama lasted a good portion, Yay. but eventually went the way of <laughs> yeah. what I think many Kokodama do. <laughs> yes, it is an ephemeral art, but yeah, I've gotten some of them to last a couple years, and that's pretty much the outside for them. And then some I remake halfway through just because the plant inside might outgrow its little moss ball base. And I'll be giving that again this year um, in January at Brookside Gardens. But of course, because of um, COVID and social distancing, I think the class is now capped at eight people and we're holding it in the auditorium. Um, So we'll be greatly distanced. Everybody will have their own big table with another Mm -hmm. table in between. So yeah, that'll be interesting, but I'm glad that we're still able to at least hold it even at a smaller scale. So that will be fun. Yeah. Excellent. And have, have you taken, I was just going to ask about some other KCDC classes that you might've taken, maybe not non-gardening related that, that you recommend. Oh, wow. The hard, the hard thing about recommending a KCDC class is mm-hmm. mainly do one-off classes. So yeah. um, I, I've taught foraging a couple of times. I know you've done some repeat classes that have been popular, but um, a lot of them are kind of catch it or else you'll miss it. <laughs> yeah. And they always have such quirky, fun subject matter. A lot of them that I, that I see that I'm like, darn, I'm giving a class during that time, or I would take this one. And I will warn people that when they do come back to being in person, they fill fast. Like yeah. I've, I've seen them fill in a matter of minutes. Um, you know, they'll go online at like 8 a.m. on a Saturday. And they'll usually, if you're on the mail list, they'll tell you a day or two in advance mm-hmm. it's going to go up. And you better have your finger on that button <laughs> to sign up for it. But I'll also say you better be ready to actually come because mm-hmm. I exactly. believe is when people RSVP um, and then take up a space that someone else could otherwise take. And then, um, I mean, I, I taught, um, I have this this class cooking scrappy that I, I've done for Reading DC, I've done it for KCDC and um, somewhere else too, I think. But um, we had we had one in-person instance of it and we had, we you know, we had a, a waiting list, but then many of the people didn't actually show up who were on the original list. So, you know, respect your volunteer teachers time and organizers with that sort of thing. I know, you know, I, when it comes to like webinars and things like that, we're kind of all in the habit of just RSVPing for things so that we get the reminder, but um, in person is kind of different. Yeah. That's a great, a great point, especially with something with uh, such limited resources um, and dependent on volunteers. But the nice thing, about, I mean, I feel like there there have been sil- silver linings to um, all that's transpired this year, and and one is just that um, you know with, with with things like Knowledge Commons DC, we've been able to reach a lot more people. That um, that foraging um, tour that I I did, um, there were I think over a hundred people that tuned in for that um, via Instagram Live too, which is a kind of a weird like I didn't know if people would actually turn out. Um, so it's nice to be able to, you know, to bring the knowledge to more people than you could in an in-person event at the same time, you know, you do lose a bit of the intimacy, obviously. And not being able to actually touch and taste and feel the plant in person um, is a little different, but still great to be able to reach many more people that way. Um, and how can our listeners contact you? So if they're interested in say, joining the mycological society or getting links for kcdc or following up to try out bloom sure um so um 
My my email for Bloom is April at bloomsoil.com. And you can feel free to email me for, for any recommendations or questions. Personally, I um, probably am most um, findable via Instagram. And my handle is Prilly T. That's P-R-I-L-L-Y-T-E-E. And I um, I also have a website, April Writes. Um, I'm a, a food writer and, and do other types of writing. Um, so aprilwrites.com, you can also contact me through that. Great. And uh, wanted to thank you for joining us today and maybe put you on the spot and ask you for one favorite recipe. And that doesn't even have to be something with forage material, but maybe from your food writing background. Oh, geez. Let's see. Um, mushroom bacon, um, which does not taste like bacon, <laughs> but is pretty tasty and super simple and a great, a great way to, um, to use up a lot of mushrooms because um, mushrooms can go um, mushy pretty fast as, as, you know, pretty much anyone who's, you know, bought the common button mushroom will know. Um, but you want to thinly slice them. Um, and then um, in terms of the, the flavoring, um, some type of oil, um, a bit of soy sauce. I like a little bit of liquid smoke. Um, and then you can add a little of other flavoring, but really you don't, you don't need anything else. Um, and then you're going to um, just sort of um, mix the mushrooms um, after they've been sliced in with that and then lay them out on a baking sheet. And um, you want to bake it at not a super high temperature. I can't, I can't tell you off the top of my head what, what I, I did. Maybe, you know, maybe 250 or 300 at the most um, for as long, it, as long as it takes to get them kind of crispy. And the, the water in the mushrooms, because mushrooms tend to, you know, have a high moisture content, will sort of um, evaporate. And you're just kind of left with these nice little umami bombs. Mm, that does sound delicious. I think you sold me just with the word bacon. <laughs> <laughs> there. So thank you again, April. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Plant Profile Smokebush Smokebush is a shrub with many ornamental qualities. It has beautiful foliage and the airy seed heads look like puffs of smoke surrounding the bush. Smokebush, Cotinus cogigria, is also known as Rus Cotinus, the European smoke tree, and Venetian sumac. It is a member of the cashew family. There is an American native version as well, Cotinus obovatus. It needs full sun to put on a real smoke show, but it can tolerate shade conditions. It is a tough plant and needs little care. It is hardy from zones 5 to 8. It can reach up to 6 feet high and wide. Use caution when mowing or working around a smoke bush, as the bark is thin and easily damaged by weed whackers or other garden equipment. It is deer and rabbit resistant. Popular cultivars available include Winecraft Gold with bright golden foliage, and Winecraft Black, which has dramatic dark foliage and a dwarf habit. Look in Garden Center starting in 2021 for a new introduction called The Velvet Fog from the Proven Winners brand. It has bright pink plumes with blue-green foliage. Smokebush makes a good accent plant in the landscape, or it can be grown in a grouping to form a hedge. It is deciduous and drops its leaves in late fall. It can be trained and pruned to grow as a tree or a shrub. To prune smoke tree, wait until late winter or early spring and selectively remove entire branches to attain the shape you like. Smoke bush, you can grow that. For this week's What's Blooming in the Garden segment, I thought I'd share some of my favorite fall foliage plants. 
number one in my garden is the Stewardia pseudocamellia. It's not really known for its fall foliage. You're always looking out for those camellia-like flowers, but this time of year, it is gorgeous. It's kind of a peachy orange color for most of the foliage, which is almost an exact match for my nearby yard flamingos. So I always get some fun out of positioning them together um, for the color matching and taking a few photos every fall. The next thing I really look out for in the fall is my Fother Gila shrubs. Um, so again, known mostly for their spring flowers, um, surprisingly beautiful in the autumn. They go from a glowing kind of yellow orange to a burgundy and just a really lovely leaf shades. And then my final personal favorite is ginkgo. Um, they just turn an amazing gold yellow all over and then you blink an eye and all the leaves have dropped to the ground and you're walking through this just wonderful golden carpet. So look out for local ginkgos in your area, especially like a grove by say an office park or a museum or in um, a public garden that you can watch and check on every few days for that dramatic leaf drop. And then I thought I'd mention a few things that aren't normally thought of at all for fall color, um, and that's crepe myrtle. So my crepe myrtle, um, Natchez especially, has a gorgeous deep red color in the fall, and you don't really think of it as a, as a fall color um, leaf attraction. And then there's my hosta bed, which some of them do turn straight to brown or kind of a sickly yellow, but others like Paul's Glory has a really nice um, seasonal change and it goes from to a really beautiful gold. And then my final, you wouldn't think about it as a fall foliage plant, are my huge oak trees. Now, some years they do go straight to muddy brown, admittedly, but other years, particularly this fall, they go through a really nice red shade um, and they've been hanging on for a little bit and then dropping and looking pretty good. And I think it's that we had a pretty moist um, late summer into early fall. And that's why this year the oaks are looking particularly good. I hope you get out to a local public garden or park sometime in the next couple of weeks to enjoy the foliage. Um, of various trees and shrubs and then of course look around your garden and see what you can discover. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.